Let's take a look at the logic behavior dominant personality and strategies and techniques for their interview. Tip number 97. Hey, welcome back. This is Stan Walters, your host, with 101 Tips for Interviewing and Interrogation. This time around, we're going to talk about the logic behavior dominant personality and the strategies and techniques that work for them. Let me remind you again that the sources of this go all the way back to early 20th century with Dr. Carl Jung, J U N G, and his work on archetypes and anime and animos. Uh, you need to look at the work uh, on, on disk system and look at personality typing that we use now in, in organizational psychology and how we classify and assign uh, different people and employees to jobs. What we're looking at here though, again as I've mentioned before, we're looking at the dark side. How do these people deal with conflict? How do they deal with a situation where there's a lot of stress involved and subjects tend to go to their strength, go to what they're predisposed to? Remember, these are not locked in, solid, rigid type of personalities that there's you know, exact boundaries, a little uh, specifically demarcation between each group. You have a strong tendency toward one area. Now, life events and socialization, um, faith, things like that come into play that modify the strength of some of these personalities, highlight some of the characteristics and emphasize some of the others. But as the interviewer, remember that the three things that the interviewer that's the greatest success has picked up three things. Number one, it's a narrative-based format interview, which the entire practical connection interview process is a confirmed, it is a nar true narrative-based. The purpose of persuasion is information and not confession. Big difference. Persuasion toward confession is not a narrative-based interview format. Persuasion toward information recovery is. Okay? Second thing, the interviewer adjusted to the cognitive emotional changes Go back and look at our anger, depression, and I'll bring acceptance segments a little bit earlier in the entire series. But that third critical piece is what we're working on here with the emotion dominant, we've already talked about, sensory behavior dominant, now the logic behavior dominant. Now the logic behavior dominant, and again, these are terms that, that I've adapted and labeled just to trigger to keep things straight in my mind and how I perceive this subject. Nothing you know, scientific or clinical about it, just a, a memory function, if you will. They strive for the accuracy and logic of events. They're, they're very logical thinkers. That does not mean they're smarter than anybody else. That does not mean they have a higher IQ or they're more intelligent. That's not what I'm telling you. It's only how they solve problems and how they see the world and how they collate that information and how they treat it and process it. So they like things in that logic-oriented format. Now, they're not like Spock or Data, if you're a Star Trek fan. Or, you know, they're not something like that. Again, please understand this. Now, so everything has to be uh, connected. There's a cause and reason and logic seen for why it occurs. And they need to understand the back end of it as to what the progression is that got it there. Now, these are slow, careful thinkers. Slow, not in terms of like being not smart or not intelligent. Slow, like a chess master. Slow like somebody playing a very involved chess game. What happens when you ask a question, they're actually running through several simulations. And, and they've had to, I've had them tell me this, what they're thinking in their mind. That's where I'm getting a lot of this information too, is from all the prison inmates that we've talked and interviewed. So what happens when you ask a question, they're looking back to the last two or three questions, possibly, that you've asked to see if they can tell where you're going. Then they'll run simulations of what are the uh, variations of answers that I can give, these two, three, four answers. And then what would be the interviewer's response to each of my countermeasures or to my counter responses? So they're running all those options to see which one is their best. What drives them to decision is their evaluation of accuracy and logic. They want things to be accurate, they want things to be specific, they don't like gray in the areas. So this person is a very dogmatic thinker, they tend to be quite rigid. Uh, once they have their minds made up, it's, it, you've got to really work to, to get them to, um, uh, to, to overweigh them, to, to persuade them that their information is incorrect or they're holding information. And here's the point. I bet you figure this out. We talked sometime earlier about the two types of deception. There was embellishment and there's omission. What type of deception do you think would be the most popular or the favorite for the logic dominant subject? Okay, if you said omission, that's right. They, they, are, they don't like creative abstract things. What they're doing is they're kind of testing you at the same time. So they'll leave information out, 
They're notorious for it. Now, one symptom, one cue does not make the person a whole logic dominant, all right? But what they're doing is they're leaving it out and they want to see if you're smart enough, you're intelligent enough to figure out what's missing or to see what's illogically out of place or if they've skipped a logical step. That's what they're looking for. Typically, they're very critical listeners. The emotion dominant was a, a careful listener. He's listening because he thinks he's going to hear the answer. Logic dominants tell me that when I've talked to them and what they're doing, it's not listening so much to your language. They're not so much listening to your words. They're listening to how you think. Follow that? They're listening to how you think. They're listening to how your logic works. That's what they'll go after is your reasoning and your line of logic. That's what they're hearing from you. They don't use a lot of emotion. Now, now think, if, if a person's very uh, objective and logical, emotions tend to be the far side. So you don't get a lot of emotion out of them. And therefore, you don't get lots and lots of body language. They tend to be quite mute with their body language behavior. So this can be a challenge in your And so here's the rule. This, this is how logic dominance uh, behavior types think. Uh, now listen very carefully to this. Every single step must be accounted for. Okay, got that? Every single step must be accounted for. So for example, in order to you have, for you to have C, what must you have before you have C? Now, if you're thinking A and B, that's wrong. Let me repeat the guideline. Every single step must be accounted for. So why is A and B wrong? You've jumped two steps. So you have to account for it. Now, you, it, it's not going to drive you nuts. It's not going to take, my God, take forever, okay? But you lead them right down step by step as if they're in a formula. Now, when I was in high school, I had a chemistry teacher named Mildred Pyle. Now, tell me that's not a great high school chemistry teacher's name, right? Mildred Pyle was a really good scientist, and she told us that she had worked on the, the Oak Ridge, um, the uh, Manhattan Project in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, one of the grunt scientists and so forth. It's very, very demanding. And she would give us a chemistry test, chemical test, right? And we have a chemistry test. It'd be 10 questions. You had to do a chemical equation. And she always demanded you show your work, which is part of the scientific principle that Francis Bacon, the philosopher, talked about in developing what the scientific principle is. You come up with theory, then you test different hypotheses and prove or disprove the theory, okay? But you had to show your work. So let's say I got a question, and I got the right answer. I showed my work like I took a shortcut, okay? She would call you up to her desk, and she always called the students with her last name. Okay, so Mr. Walters, how'd you get this answer? And you say, well, Ms. Pyle, it's right here. There's my work. She said, yeah, but what's that part right there? You say, well, that's a shortcut. She said, well, how am I supposed to know that? She said, in, in scientific method, you can't assume that a thousand years from now, somebody would find your research, find your notes that you must objectively take and document every step, that they'll know that shortcut in calculations is there. So I got the right answer, showed my work, took a shortcut in the calculations. Out of 10 points, how many points would she give you? Zero. There is no vote. There is no consensus like, well, 9 out of 10 scientists say it either is or is not in the scientific principle. That's along the line this person thinks. So I'm going to put back up here for you. Remember we talked some uh, videos back about the grid, working the grid, and talked to Dr. Lee's uh, diagram on, on trace evidence. I found this worked very well for me. The logic dominant interview runs slowly. It's, it's, um, it's very tedious and you've got to work without getting any feedback. One of the things to use with Dr. Lee's grid, when I saw him do this several times when I was on the platform with him and we were in homicide conferences, was as a way to put the case together and how to see your case. Now you should do this to be a good plan in your, for example, in your piece model, do this before you walk in. So look at the grid right here. Okay, or here, depending on which side I put the, the graphic on. What do you think is the most important part of that grid? The evidence? No. Nope. No, it's not suspect. It's the arrows. It's the lines. It's tying all the tiniest pieces together. It's the little threads you make. So it's not one aha and it's boom and it goes. It's slowly building almost like a net or a mesh or an integrated system, interlocking system that the evidence goes. So you work slowly, ask a question, wait for the answer. Don't get in a rush, because your mind's running. They will give you a response. If you're not getting the answer you want, number two things happen. Number one, you've asked the question wrong. 
it's too general, be more specific, all right? Or number two, they're leaving something out. That's where you look for. That's the point you look for. So for you, the interviewer, you're slowly putting, they've got their argument here. I use an analysis in class or analogy. Here's a cannonball on the scales. Here's the other side of the scales. Over here, you're putting a buckshot one at a time. So it won't be one of these moments. It's, it's almost imperceptible. But there are such slaves to logic, slaves to order and organization, that when the, the, the balance starts to go that way, they see it, they understand it, and you have effectively outweighed their argument. Take your time. Don't try to be emotional with them. Don't try to wrench an emotional response out of them. They're hard to read. They're going to be seen as very cold. They do not waste language. They tend to be very um, frugal with their language and words. So you have to wait. Don't expect long answers uh, and don't expect a long warm-up period with them because that doesn't really happen with them. So take your time, put it piece to piece together, put the threads together, and the logic is what will outweigh them. So take a look at the other two and, and think about people you know around you, think about people in the public you know, and, and see if you can start thinking about how they classify and start talking to them in that form. So you mirror that person back to them. That's that third piece connection. Understand the unique personality of the person we're talking to and watch what happens when you make that connection. Close is good enough. You don't have to be exact. Close is good enough and still pay attention to cognitive and emotional responses. You'll get the effective response from that strategy and tactics with the logic behavior dominant subject. Be sure to hit the like button. Please hit share. Send around to as many folks as possibly can. We're getting into this series. We have a wonderful 101 uh, tapes here that are valuable to you. Welcome to use you for your training for your agencies. And in fact, if you want to do some uh, customized training for your agency, give me a call. Let's talk about how we can plan successful interview training, creation, training programs for you people. So until we see you back for tip number 98, this is Stan Walters reminding you, be safe.